The Hiding Place by Corey Tenboom. Chapter 8 Storm Clouds Gather. If evenings were pleasant, daytimes grew increasingly tense. We were too big, the group was too large, the web too widespread. For a year and a half now, we had got away with our double lives. Ostensibly, we were still an elderly watchmaker living with his two spinster daughters above his tiny shop. In actuality, the Bayet was the center of an underground ring that spread now to the farthest corners of Holland. Here daily came dozens of workers, reports, appeals. Sooner or later, we were going to make a mistake. It was mealtimes especially when I worried. There were so many now for every meal that we had to set the chairs diagonally around the dining room table. The cat loved this arrangement. Yussi had given him the Hebrew name, Meir Shalal Hashbaz, meaning, appropriately enough, hastening to the spoils, hurrying to the prey. With the chairs set so close, M.S. Hashbaz would circle the entire table on our shoulders, purring furiously, traveling round and round, but it was uneasy being so many. The dining room was only five steps above street level. A tall passerby could see right in the window. We'd hung a white curtain across it, providing a kind of screen while letting in light. Still, only when the heavy blackout shades were drawn at night did I feel truly private. At lunch one day, looking through the thin curtain, I thought I saw a figure standing just outside in the alley. When I looked again a minute later, it was still there. There was no reason for anyone to linger there unless he was curious about what went on in the Bayet. I got up and parted the curtain an inch. Standing a few feet away, seemingly immobilized by some terrible emotion, was old Katrine from Nolly's house. I bolted down the stairs, threw open the door, and pulled her inside. Although the August day was hot, the old lady's hands were cold as ice. Katrine, what are you doing here? Why were you just standing there? She's gone mad, she sobbed. Your sister's gone mad. Nolly, what's happened? They came, she said, the SD. I don't know what they knew or who told them. Your sister and Annalise were in the living room and I heard her. The sobs broke out again. I heard her. Heard what? I nearly screamed. Heard what she told them. They pointed at Annalise and said, is this a Jew? And your sister said, yes. I felt my knees go weak. Annalise, blonde, beautiful young Annalise, with perfect papers. And she trusted us. Oh, Nolly, Nolly, what has your rigid honesty done? And then, I asked, I don't know. I ran out the back door. She's gone mad. I left Katrine in the dining room, wheeled my bicycle down the stairs, and bumped as fast as I could the mile and a half to Nolly's. Today, the sky did not seem larger above the wagon wig. At the corner of Boss and Hoven's strat, I leaned my bike against a lamppost and stood panting, my heart throbbing in my throat. Then, as casually as I was able, I strolled up the sidewalk toward the house. Except for a car parked at the street curb directly in front, everything looked deceptively normal. I walked past, not a sound from behind the white curtains, nothing to distinguish this house from the replicas of it on either side. When I got to the corner, I turned around, and at that moment, the door opened and Nolly came out. Behind her walked a man in a brown business suit. A minute later, a second man appeared, half pulling, half supporting Annalise. The young woman's face was white as chalk. Twice before they reached the car, I thought she would faint. The car door slammed, the motor roared, and they were gone. I pedaled back to the Bayet, fighting back tears of anxiety.
Molly, we soon learned, had been taken to the police station around the corner to one of the cells in back. But Annalise had been sent to the old Jewish theater in Amsterdam, from which Jews were transported to extermination camps in Germany and Poland. It was Maichi, stooped, careworn little Maichi, whose offer of help we had discounted, who kept us in touch with Nali. She was in wonderful spirits, Maichi said, singing hymns and songs in her high, sweet soprano. How could she sing when she had betrayed another human being? Maichi delivered the bread that Betsy baked for Nali each morning, and the blue sweater Nali asked for, her favorite, with flowers embroidered over the pocket. Maichi relayed another message from Nali, one especially for me. No ill will happen to Annalise. God will not let them take her to Germany. He will not let her suffer because I obeyed him. Six days after Nolly's arrest, the telephone rang. Pickwick's voice was on the other end. I wonder, my dear, if I could trouble you to deliver that watch yourself. A message then that he could not relay over the phone. I biked at once out to Erdenhot, taking along a man's watch for safe measure. Pickwick waited until we were in the drawing room with the door shut. The Jewish theater in Amsterdam was broke into last night. Forty Jews were rescued. One of them, a young woman, was most insistent that Nali know Annalise is free. He fixed me with one of his wide-set eyes. Do you understand this message? I nodded, too overcome with relief and joy to speak. How had Nolly known? How had she been so sure? After 10 days in the Harlem jail, Nolly was transferred to the federal prison in Amsterdam. Pickwick said that the German doctor in charge of the prison hospital was a humane man who occasionally arranged a medical discharge. I went at once to Amsterdam to see him. But what could I say, I wondered, as I waited in the entrance hall of his home? How could I get into the good graces of this man? Lolling about the foyer, sniffing from time to time at my legs and hands, were three perfectly huge Doberman pinchers. I remembered the book we were reading aloud by Bicycle Lamp, How to Win Friends and Influence People. One of the techniques advocated by Dale Carnegie was find the man's hobby. Hobby? Dogs, I wonder. At last, the maid returned and showed me into a small sitting room. How smart of you, doctor, I said in German to the grizzle-haired man on the sofa. Smart? Yes, to bring these lovely dogs with you. They must be good company when you have to be away from your family. The doctor's face brightened. You like dogs, then? About the only dogs I had ever known were Harry DeVries' bulldogs. Bulls are my favorite. Do you like bulls? People don't realize it, the doctor said eagerly, but bulldogs are very affectionate. For perhaps ten minutes, while I racked my brain for everything I had ever heard or read on the subject, we talked about dogs. Then abruptly, the doctor stood up. But I'm sure you haven't come here to talk about dogs. What's on your mind? I met his eyes. I have a sister in prison here in Amsterdam. I was wondering if, I don't think she's well. The doctor smiled. So you aren't interested in dogs at all? I'm interested now, I said, smiling too. But I'm far more interested in my sister. What's her name? Nolly Van Worden. The doctor went out of the room and came back with a brown notebook. Yes, one of the recent arrivals. Tell me something about her. What is she in prison for? Taking a chance, I told the doctor that Nolly's crime had been hiding a Jew. I also told him that she was the mother of six children, who, if left without aid, could become a burden to the state. I did not mention that the youngest of these children was now 17. Well, we'll see. He walked to the door of the sitting room. You must excuse me now. I was more encouraged than at any time since Nolly's arrest as I rode the train back to Harlem. 
But days, then a week, then two weeks passed, and there was no further news. I went back to Amsterdam. I've come to see how those Dobermans are, I told the doctor. He was not amused. You must not bother me. I know you have not come to talk about dogs. You must give me time. So there was nothing to do but wait. It was a bright September noon when 17 of us were squeezed around the dining room table. All of a sudden, Nils, seated across from me, turned pale. Nils, one of our workers, had come to report old Katrine safely arrived at a farm north of Alkmaar. Now Nils spoke in a low, normal voice. Do not turn around. Someone is looking over the curtain. Over the curtain? But that was impossible. He'd have to be ten feet high. The table fell silent. He's on a ladder, washing the window, Nils said. I didn't order the windows washed, said Betsy. Whoever it was, we mustn't sit here in this frozen, guilty silence. Yusi had an inspiration. Happy birthday, he sang. Happy birthday to you. We all got the idea and joined in lustily. Happy birthday, dear old pa. The song was still echoing through the bay when I went out the side door and stood next to the ladder, looking up at the man holding the bucket and sponge. What are you doing? We didn't want the windows washed, especially not during a party. The man took a piece of paper from his hip pocket and consulted it. Isn't this Kuiper's? They're across the street. But anyhow, come in and help us celebrate. The man shook his head. He thanked me, but he had work to do. I watched him crossing the Bartle Jorstraut with his ladder to Kuiper's candy store. Did it work? A clamor of voices asked when I got back to the dining room. Do you think he was spying? I didn't answer. I didn't know. And I think we'll pause here for now. Thank you so much for listening. Tigger says ta-ta for now. I love you guys. Bye-bye.